Hello, welcome to the Friday, May 19th, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Centers Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I am recording from San Diego, California. Last weekend showed how important it is to keep your systems patched, but the challenge is to stay abreast of what patches are available for your organization's systems. Xavier put together a little Python script to help you with just that. The script will monitor the CVE database for vulnerabilities that match your selected profile, so you can select operating systems and software that you you are interested in and then it will send you an email whenever it finds a new vulnerability. It's pretty easy to use and in particular for smaller organizations maybe a nice supplement to regular vulnerability scans. WannaCry, of course, incited a discussion about the duty of government organizations and other researchers to disclose vulnerabilities they discover. One argument that is sometimes used is that if one entity is able to discover the vulnerability, then others will probably do so as well. As a result, these other entities may as well then use this vulnerability against you. So it's in your best interest to disclose them to the vendor and have a patch available for your own networks as well. And uh, what happens as more and more researchers, of course, discover certain vulnerabilities, the risk and the probability of these vulnerabilities being disclosed, of course, increases. So far, there wasn't really any good data about sort of the rediscovery rate of vulnerabilities. But in March, a paper by Trey Herr actually looked into this question a little bit more systematic. He had a number of different data sets to look at. One of the more recent ones was a database of Android vulnerabilities discovered between 2015 and 2016. And essentially he looked at how many of these vulnerabilities were reported multiple times. And well, he found 22% of vulnerabilities were rediscovered at least once within two months of their initial disclosure. Like I said, the paper looks at the number of additional older data sets as well, like uh, OpenSSL and a couple other open source projects, of course, uh, where you can check their bug database in order to see how often a particular vulnerability was reported before it was made public. What he found was that actually over the last few years, the rediscovery rate was increasing. I'm not really sure why, but I can see where First of all, it has become more popular to report this uh, vulnerabilities, in particular with bug bounties, of course, but then also some of the tools and methodologies to look for vulnerabilities have been more standardized. So there are really more people out there probably that are looking for the same type of vulnerability. Now, if you got hit by WannaCry last weekend, there is now a small sliver of hope that you could get your files back even if you don't pay the ransom. Given that WannaCry is pretty solid when it comes to the crypto and does not send any keys over the network, a simple decryption tool is probably not going to arrive anytime soon. But it turns out the key used to decrypt files may still be present in memory. Well, actually, not the key itself, but in order to create the user RSA key that is then used to encrypt the individual file encryption key WannaCry does use prime numbers that are not erased when the key is erased from memory. So by recovering these prime numbers, it's possible to recover the key. And the tool WannaKey that has now been released as open source will search memory for these prime numbers and use them to reconstruct the private key file. I wouldn't call this an ultimate fix or even sort of something that you should put a lot of hope into, but uh, well, it's better than nothing. And if you're 
desperate. It's really your only choice at this point. Rebooting the system, of course, will clear out that memory and destroy these primes. So this only will work if you haven't rebooted your system yet. And well, today is Friday, so I got an other Sense Technology Institute student with me here to talk about his research. This time we got David Brown. David Brown is going to talk with me a little bit about actually a blue team topic uh, that is very aligned with my interest. Uh, he looked into using Splunk to hunt for compromise. So uh, Dave, uh, can you introduce yourself a little bit to our listeners? Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is David Brown. I'm calling from Denver, Colorado, and um, I have an MBA and a CISSP. Um, and currently, um, I'm pursuing a master's at the Sands Technology Institute. And yeah, the master's program has been both challenging and very rewarding. Uh, in your paper, you're talking about how to use Splunk so, you know, to find anomalies, to do some threat hunting. Uh, can you sort of just summarize of the when when you use Splunk uh, to look for bad stuff in your network, what are sort of your top three things to look for? Yeah, so um, when trying to determine, you know, there's so much noise that's put off by you know all the different systems across the network these days. Um, I kind of it's akin to a 747 taking off, and how do you really narrow down through all that noise to look at the the indicators that someone bad is inside of your network? So. Uh, for that, I kind of turned to the Center for Internet Security's critical security controls to kind of see once these controls are implemented, like application whitelisting, what are some things that we could look for that would kind of cue us off to uh, um, someone who's malicious inside of our environment? So, you know, probably my top two from, um, from that are listening to application whitelisting. So if someone tries to execute an application and that application is blocked, how soon do we know about that, and are we are we watching for those? Um, the other one that's very interesting to me is watching for uh, DHCP requests, um, so so that we know the moment that a new piece of equipment is plugged into the network, and if that is something we're expecting or not expecting, um, you know, then we can act accordingly. Now, a Splunk, of course, is a pretty expensive and capable piece of commercial software. Have you looked at all how some of the this is sort of applicable to open source software. If you don't have the money, the cash to put out uh, to buy a commercial solution, anything uh, you can recommend that you played with that could use some of this uh, open source? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think originally I was debating between using Splunk and Logstash um, for for this this research paper. Um, I I went with Splunk from the perspective of if you focus on only passing really pertinent information into Splunk, um, then it becomes a much more affordable prospect. I think using Splunk's universal forwarders, you can say, I want this piece of log data, not that piece of log data. And so you can kind of pre-filter out a lot of the noise before you pass it into Splunk. But if you are going all in and kind of just passing all your logs, um, log stash has seemed to be a much more affordable option. Now, uh, looking at uh, sort of a multi-operating system environment, uh, do you find that network protocols, like for example DHCP and such, are generic enough uh, where you don't have to write sort of different rules for different operating systems? Uh, any lessons there that you can share? Yeah, with, with DHCP, I think the, the rules were very straightforward, whether it's a Mac connecting or a VoIP phone or you know Windows PC, you write just one basic rule inside of Splunk, and you get the alerts along with, um, you know, uh, MAC addresses and, and things like that of the requester. Uh, with whitelisting, it becomes a lot more difficult um, to achieve. Uh, I mainly focused in the paper listening for whitelisting on uh, Windows computers. Now, of course, uh, today, the day we record this happens to be Microsoft's uh, Patch Tuesday. Do you have to continuously update these whitelisting rules or do you have any mechanisms there to help you or any tricks that you can share? How do you sort of keep those whitelisting rules up to date? Yeah, when you're trying, so for the paper, I tried to go the most economical approach and that was kind of using AppLocker. Um, with AppLocker, it, it seems to be from a updating your rules perspective and managing it so you're not investing too many uh, man hours in it. 
It seems to be the most economical to do a certificate-based whitelisting approach or a directory-based whitelisting approach, assuming that your directories are locked down to administrative users only. Um, if you're using you know, a more um, commercial tool out there like um, Bit9, then those lists can kind of be updated for you. But yeah, with, with AppLocker, the, the approach that I kind of took in the paper was more directory or certificate-based. And of course, uh, one of the reasons often put forward sort of for this threat hunting approach and such is uh, that it can take an awful long time to discover that uh, someone is actually already in your network if you're not really looking for it. Uh, in your experience, these approaches, have they sort of significantly cut down the time that it takes you to sort of find a compromised system? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think so, you know, in the past, if someone would compromise a, a single workstation with with malware, if your antivirus software didn't pick it up, then that person, you know, can just start trying all these different tools to fully own that box. Whereas, whereas now, if someone finds a way to compromise a machine, let's say through like a flash exploit or something like that, then the second they try to bring their own tools into that environment and execute any of, of, of their own tools, you get an alert immediately um, saying that this tool that um, that has not been whitelisting is trying to run in your environment. And you can immediately go to that workstation and, and figure out what's going on. Yeah, that's a really sort of an interesting approach then there. Now, uh, what's next sort of? Now, where are you going to take this or what are you working on uh, right now? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the interesting avenue is once you've really implemented um, a lot of the critical um, security controls and once you're kind of watching for these signals that those critical security controls put off, um, it's interesting to start to think about what are the tools embedded in, in the different operating systems um, like PowerShell that an attacker can kind of use to advance their attacks. So if PowerShell is installed in your environment and the attacker gains access to that box, well, then they can start using PowerShell to pivot around and that wouldn't set off any alarms. Um, so. The next kind of thing that I'm digging into is, you know, how do you either remove or control some of those really powerful built-in um, operating system tools like PowerShell? Yeah, that sounds a real good idea. And actually, you haven't uh, listened to it yet, uh, but uh, the last week's uh, interview that uh, we'll have ahead of yours, uh, we'll just talk about that PowerShell aspect somewhat. Now, as far as STI goes, where are you at in your degree? Almost done or in the middle? Yeah, I'm about two thirds of the way through, and yeah, it's been a very, a very rewarding, enjoyable experience. Learned a ton. Yeah, thanks, and thanks for sharing some of this uh, here with uh, our listeners. Uh, this again uh, was uh, David Brown, and uh, he's an STI student. If you're interested in STI, you can learn more about it at sans.edu. And as always, if you have any feedback, any questions about these interviews, just uh, drop me a note.